Ladies and gentlemen, I've been, uh, I've been ordered by Yona to get started here, so uh, I want to thank all of you again uh, for participating and joining us in our seminar. Certainly it's an extraordinarily timely uh, topic that we're going to discuss today, given the, uh, given the turmoil and the problems in Iraq and Syria and, and of course, the uh, uh, Israeli challenge in the Gaza and all of that kind of thing. And so we thought that it would be uh, very apropos and very timely, really, to, to talk about this. And we have some uh, really distinguished uh, people that are going to discuss these things with you. Uh, Yona is going to introduce them uh, in turn. I'll, I'll kick it off with the introduction of the first speaker, which is going to be uh, General Dave Reist, who is from our own Potomac Institute, and he has a, a broad, broad experience, uh, uh, not in, in only in the Marine Corps, the Navy, and all of that type of thing, but is very, very experienced with respect to the situation in Iraq, uh, the personalities involved. He was there a number of times and there during the key uh, battles and the key arrangements that were made in Iraq uh, some years ago, and so he's going to talk about what he thinks uh, he thinks the situation is and what he thinks uh, ought to be done about it, I guess, uh, with respect to Iraq. So, Dave, why don't you go ahead and kick it off? Sir, can you, can you yeah. speak from there? Because uh, we have the television. Gentlemen? Yeah, I will. Thank you, sir. All right, Dave. General Gray, I appreciate that, and once again, I want to echo thank you for all coming. Yona, thank, thank you for including me in this, uh, this panel. Uh, there are really some great names. In, uh, in 2001, I had the opportunity to listen to Admiral Crow. Uh, Admiral Crow was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs from 1985 to 1989, and then was, he was the U.S. ambassador to the United Kingdom from 1994 to 1997. Uh, just before assuming the billet as the ambassador to, to the uh, U.K., he was making his initial tour, and he was directed to go around and get all the briefs. And he, when he did that, he came back and he was talking to the prime minister. And the prime minister said, well, have you visited all of, all of UK? And he said, yes, I have. He goes, well, what did you think? Beautiful country. I'm looking forward to it. He said, uh, did anybody talk to you about Northern Ireland? And he said, yes, they did. He said, do you understand it? He said, I believe I do. The response from the prime minister was, then it wasn't an explained right to you. Uh, that is what I would term a lot of the Middle East writ large, but especially Iraq. Uh, I've never, I am not going to profess to be an expert in any way, shape, or form on, on Iraq. It is a very complex area. Uh, it's one of those things, uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, and uh, one will judge it as they see it and how it's been explained to them. So with that, what does the U.S. want Iraq to look like as an end state? And I think we have to ask that question up front, and our, our, our actions and our strategy are they consistent towards that end state? And if they're not, and we waver, what's that going to do to the Iraqis that possibly think that we support them, or maybe we don't support them, and other nations? How do we get there? And what have we done in the past? A lot of folks credit the surge in 2007 that turned Iraq. I would offer that's not so. I was in Anbar from 2006 for my third tour there, in 2006 from 2007. Anbar had already turned. So I, I, I will say that and argue that with absolutely anybody. Uh, it's not about military force, because you can only sit on the pressure cooker lid for so long. It's, yeah, I'll get to that, sir. It is about economics. Um, how have those actions worked and the actions that we've taken, have they had an everlasting impact? Are we using all our elements of national power? There's a recent report that just came out across the last couple of days that has been uh, honchoed by uh, General Jones, um, and uh, it's, it's pointing to we need to do some other things besides the military aspect. What is good enough, and what's good enough for Iraq, not what's good enough for the United States? I think sometimes the U.S. hubris and the lens that we look through sometimes, we, we get a clouded vision of that. And what's the U.S. view of Iraq as a democracy, and are they ready for that? Um, some would argue that our country is not doing too well in that, in that arena right now. And you must remember, we're a republic based on democratic ideals. We're not a democracy, okay? Uh, 
and there's, there are elements of countries navigating in those lanes that make it very, very difficult. We tend to stress governance and rule of law, but I can tell you that from the 7 March 2010 election, Mr. Alawi got 91 of the 325 seats, and Mr. Maliki got 89 of those seats, and Maliki was seated. Now, this is a complex electoral process, and I got it, except the Sunnis come back and they go, can someone explain to me why the guy who, didn't, who got the most votes didn't get seated as the PM? And as one sheikh told me when he was back here visiting Washington, D.C., this resembles very much your Florida election with the hanging chads, doesn't it? They pay attention to our system, and they know those things. He followed it with, why should we believe in your system when we have free elections and the man that, pur that purportedly won didn't get seated? That's a great question. Let me speak a minute about the disenfranchisement of the Sunnis and ask, um, is that intentional or is that just the way it's unfolding? Now, there's a Sunni perception of Mr. Maliki that I found existed with almost every single Sunni I talked with and met, and I got to this conclusion, or they, they brought it to me within 15 minutes. It's Mr. Maliki is a Shia backed by Tehran, and Tehran is pulling their strings. That's it. 15 minutes, any Sunni. And I thought to myself after a while, well, maybe they're making this up. Maybe they're blowing it out of proportion. Towards the end of my tour, and, uh, it was early in 2007, we were meeting in Mr. Maliki's uh, uh, government building, and it was with the governor of Anbar and the provincial council chair. And the provincial council chair is the senior person in that uh, arrangement. It was with the principals for Mr. Maliki's staff, and it was the first time we ever had a meeting at this level. And after the meeting, which lasted about three hours, I thought it was a very good meeting. And uh, I turned to the governor and I talked to the, turned to the provincial council chair and I said, very good meeting, gentlemen. I thought some progress was made. And they said, no. He goes, no progress was made at all. Here's what's happening. Mr. Maliki does this during the day, and then he listens to the men in long robes and long beards at night. And I said, I keep hearing that. But I, I don't know if that's true. The provincial council chair said, come with me. We walked to Mr. Maliki's office, knocked on the door, opened the door, and there was Mr. Maliki sitting there with three men with long beards and long black robes. The provincial council chair turned to me and went, see? We went in, shook hands, exchanged greetings, and left. They couldn't have staged that. I was amazed. I was, I was simply aghast at that. I ask, is Iran the hub of all of this and the link to politics? And it can't be lost of the relationship between anybody in Iran who's in power and, say, Russia and Putin and the influence that they're having at this point in time also. Uh, not my arena, but as I watch it from afar, there are too many things that are just happening here where there seems to be some collaboration for some people who draw us in, us being the United States, to the absolute edge on this. Uh, and Russia is very good at that. Iran is very good at that. But I would offer from the, disen the disenfranchisement of the Sunnis that um, if Maliki is intentionally doing this and they are putting the Sunnis in no position, a drowning man will cling to absolute anything to stay afloat. And Sunni friends of mine about six months ago told me that Maliki was sending elements into Anbar province to stir up trouble, then sending the military there to squash the trouble that he started. This was a calculated thing. I responded back, I said, well, that's like having a pet snake that gets away from you and now the snake's loose in your house. Maybe that's what's happening at this point in time with ISIS. It's just out of control, and uh, he didn't see it coming as far as he did. I don't know about that, but it's an interesting observation. Now, could there be another awakening that happened in 2007 that's credited, and I'll talk why I don't think uh, it really was 2007. I would offer it's 2004. 
Is it feasible? I would say, yes, it is. But you have to ask, what caused the awakening in 2007? It was a turn of tide at that point in time. A CIA agent that had operated for 42 months in 2006 when I met him in Iraq told me in October of 2006, October of 2006, he goes, Anbar province has been won. He goes, watch Nineveh and Saladin, the other two Sunni provinces. There will be hell to pay. Four months later, there was hell to pay in those two provinces. And the reason is the al-Qaeda got booted out of Iraq and they went elsewhere where they could do some damage. It's like squeezing a water balloon. It'll go wherever it, 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 it needs to go. But what happened in 2004 that I speak of? Here's what happened in my opinion. Some Marine reservists uh, who were with the Civil Affairs Group found some sheikhs and they reached to them. They didn't reach to them in a military manner. These Marine reservists were uh, with the Chamber of Commerce. They were vice president of city banks. They were folks like that who just put on the uniform and served. And what they went after was an economic arrangement to deal with the sheikhs to mitigate the violence so the rich men, the sheikhs, could go back to making money. It was just that simple. They didn't buy anybody, as in 2007. They didn't offer anything. They tried to struck an artful deal for economic growth. And rich men in that part of the world, or rich women in any other part of the world, they will make things happen in their areas. These folks, they saw the wisdom in that. That was instituted. Uh, violence got out of hand and some things couldn't occur. When I went back in, in 2006, I was reintroduced to those people. We think we, we made things happen. At that point in time, all elements came together in a very positive way. The beauty of going into Anbar province though in 2004 and 2006, second and third tour for me, was that Anbar province was written off as a lost cause. And when something's written off as a lost cause and somebody gives you that as a mission, it's like a bad little kid. Put him in the corner and somebody says, somebody do something with Johnny. We can't do anything with him. So you can do anything with Johnny, okay? We were allowed a very free hand. And I very much credit General Casey, who was the head at that time, and his deputy, a Brit, Lieutenant General Lamb. Very, very creative thinkers. And uh, some very interesting things were done that brought things about that never make the newspapers and never should make the newspapers because that's how we need to conduct business sometimes. Not everything has to be, be on the front page. But there's a saying that success has a thousand fathers and failure is an orphan. And uh, Iraq is a perfect, I think, saying for that. Prior to 2007, nobody wanted to put their moniker on this at all. After that, everybody and their brother was responsible for one form or another. Now, nobody's going to go near it again. If it turns again, you watch how many fathers come out of the woodwork. Okay, right now, Iraq's an orphan. Nobody's going to touch it, unfortunately. In approach, go after the economics. Why? Same way in our country. If there's a restaurant right across the street and there's trouble outside the street, that restaurant owner is going to call the police. And the police aren't going to let something happen in a nice neighborhood because it's bad for business. The sheikhs look at it the exact same way. Now I realize there's a modicum that has to be reached with security. And I'm not saying that you don't need some element of political, some military. Okay? But businessmen will protect their interests and they will do whatever it takes. Don't think like an American here. Okay? Think like you're a street fighter and there's no rules. They will do whatever they have to do. It happened in our country from 1865 to 1900 when the robber barons did the same thing. They had their own armies, they bought and sold politicians, and they got things done. For the benefit of our country, all the water level rose, jobs were created. It's not nice, it's very messy, but it happens. It's happened in our history, it'll happen in theirs. There's other ways to go about things. A closing thought. President Eisenhower said, war is mankind's most tragic folly. To seek or advise its deliberate provocation is a black crime against all men. But he went further and he spoke about prolonging it as equally tragic. Now General Sherman also spoke on this point from Civil War fame. War is cruelty. There is no use trying to reform it. 
the crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. My advice, find the architects of 2004. They're out there. They've already been reached to by the Iraqis. They're just waiting to be found. Thank you. While we're waiting for Yona, Dave, why don't you tell them uh, when you mention the fact that uh, about the terrorists and stuff like that, tell them uh, what the sheikh said. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of it. When, yeah, when they were questioned about about the terrorists and the, the sheikhs just turned and looked and says, we will handle that. Don't worry about it. Now, there's sometimes you just don't want to know how some things get done, okay? <laughs> Anybody who's been a parent knows that, you know? Just, just get it done, okay? <laughs> but, uh, and it's going to be messy, and you know, it's going to be ugly, but it's messy and ugly now. So what's the end state we want? How do we want to get there? As General LeGray has schooled me numerous times, sometimes like that, too, because that's what it takes. Yona, please. Thank you, General, and thank you very much for your rich uh, overview. And, um, you know, I, I feel that uh, we can spend a full semester at least to try to analyze what, what you said. As moderator, I'm not going to capitalize. Uh, I do have um, an academic uh, obligation, housekeeping, to uh, welcome the people and uh, talk about our wonderful, uh, you know, programs with the interns, but I'm going to wait until we complete uh, the discussion. Just uh, one little footnote when you were speaking. Uh, since my name is Yona, and um, I have nothing to do with this, but Yona the prophet was sent by God to Nineveh uh, in order to warn them to uh, somehow reform their ways of life and so forth. At any rate, uh, there is a um, burial place uh, in the cemetery, a grave of Jonah the prophet and Muslim. And I'm mentioning this because just recently, one of the groups affiliated with the jihadists, they destroyed the grave that was a holy site for Muslims and Jews for thousands of years according to tradition. In other words, the point I'm making is, sure, we have to talk about the military, we have to talk about the economics, but if I may say, we have to take into account also the value system and the mm -hmm. battle of ideas and culture and so forth. This is like the Taliban uh, destroying some of the archaeological sites in Afghanistan. Now, I want to move on very quickly because to follow up the General's uh, remark, we are very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Judith Yaffe, who is known to many uh, generations, I would say almost, of students and scholars, although she is not uh, a archaeological site, but um, she worked for at least uh, 20 years at the CIA in a very ser senior uh, position related to the Middle East. And then uh, she moved into the academic uh, field uh, as a professor at the National Defense uh, University and more recently at the George Washington uh, University. She received uh, many awards for her contributions, uh, many uh, medals, and the most uh, recent one is a medal from the Pentagon, I think, in June, uh, which is a Distinguished Civil Service Medal. And I told uh, Judith if she can wear the medal, so it will maybe inspire our next generation of scholars. I'm a very modest person. Well, I know you are. That's why I mentioned that. I did it for you. Yes. Okay. <coughs> it's all yours. Oh, this is so exciting. Uh, I just learned yesterday I was being drafted, and I'm always delighted to be here, but this is something that is very close to my heart, as Yona well knows, because I've covered Iraq since I was a graduate student. Uh, it's been my research. Uh, it was my professional focus, both at CIA as an intelligence analyst. Uh, then I went, I was there for over 20 years. I just finished, I don't want to count how many years, let's just say 15. <laughs> 
at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the uh, National Defense University doing lo medium to long-term research for the Joint Chief, the Joint Staff, and the OSD. And um, yeah, I'm now at GW, but Iraq has been my passion and my interest. And let me also say this, I'm not an economic determinist. And from what I know and what I've seen and what I've experienced about Iraq, it has nothing to do about money. It has, if it did, and if only it did, wouldn't it be simple? But Iraq, as Yona points out, is much more complicated. The sheikhs of Anbar uh, are very rich people and men and women, uh, rich tribes that spread over Iraq, Saudi, Jordan, they're everywhere. It's one of the, lo uh, the Sunni tribes there are some of the largest confederations on the peninsula in Iraq in that region. So uh, to say it's just about money doesn't answer the point. There have been, uh, and I want to go through just a little bit of the uh, background because you have to. If you don't understand that, then you're not going to quite uh, follow, I think, where, where we are now. This, if this sounds like war and peace and you don't have a list, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. But I think I, I, I want to anticipate some of your questions and issues as well. Now, um, I do think, my personal and professional opinion, this is about the worst crisis. It's certainly the worst crisis Iraq could face. And we've said that a lot, but I never said it before. And I never saw a civil war in 2004 or any other time. This is a real civil war. And it's not being fought about money. And it's not all about oil. But it is about power and control and marginalization and a lot of those issues. And about some arguments and battles that precede certainly our time there and go back maybe 1,500 years or more. And the, the impact is devastating. And also, having done three years in counterterrorism at CIA at a time when we had a major enemy, and it was Iran, and we were worried about export of the revolution, um, I do see this as an ultimate, no, that's not the word, the word I wanted was as ex existential. It is an existential threat, both to Iraq, to the region, and ultimately it's going to come back here. And if we don't think so, we're hiding our heads in the sand. So the problem, I'll start with ISIS, since that's a nice place to start. But the crisis with ISIS didn't start just in June or six months ago. This problem's been there for a long time because the, the forerunner of ISIS was, of course, al-Qaeda from the surge, from the 2004-2006 uh, activities, um, which we helped to defeat by working with the sheikhs, General's right. Uh, they came to us because they wanted help after implicitly, tacitly, or actively supporting Al Qaeda, thinking they won't hurt us, it won't bother us. It did. And when it hurt their interests, and here he's right, not just economic interests though, they took power and then they were starting to intrude in family and personal matters, as in, we want your daughters to marry our soldiers, we're taking over. Uh, they said, enough is enough. Our, our power, our control, our status, our families, and our wealth are at risk. They came to us with a proposition which General Petraeus took up and expanded on. He had good advice from his Iraqi uh, um, military um, aides and uh, those who had been in the old regime and came over to us and were very helpful in being able to pinpoint the problems, the individuals, and made that a success. But I say it was a joint effort. You have to look to the, Sir the Iraqis as part of that problem, yes, but certainly part of that solution. But the problem is that we have this Islamic so-called state. Now, uh, what is dangerous here is the first time that I think an ex extremist group, and not even bin Laden could do this, controls territory, can set up a state, is now recruiting fighters and terrorists to come, obey the caliph, which is a, a call to the very religious, whether he's the real caliph or not, uh, we have to deal with this as a, a real problem, and uh, are able and have been able to expand. But the question is, how did they do it so quickly? Because uh, they didn't do it by themselves, and it didn't happen overnight. The um, organization go, does go back to the Jordanian Zarqawi, who was quite active in Jordan and in Iraq, 
and was responsible for the UN bombing, if you remember that, in Baghdad, which was quite a startling operation and killed the UN representative there, but was also responsible for a lot of, uh, for the kind of warfare which said, let's target and kill the Shia to trigger a civil war, and then we will win. And uh, he and the organization ultimately were banned uh, by al-Qaeda. This will happen in, uh, a little bit later, but the point is, Zarqawi is killed in 2006, I think, and one of the fighters with him uh, is in jail for several years, and that is the guy that we came to know as Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, a phony name, but this is the guy who calls himself today Caliph Ibrahim, and Ibrahim is his real name, who declares himself head of the Islamic State and finally appeared in in his robes in public after a long. He has a reputation as being a vicious killer, anti-Shia, and he, uh, when he, when he, he comes back after he's released from prison, which is about 2010, we held him for a couple of years, and the Iraqis, when we turned everything over to them, released him. He goes back into this organization and rebuilds it from the ground up, recreates this organization, brings in recruits, starts to plan for what ultimately will become and again, the opportunity comes with the war in Syria, and they have successes in Syria, and yes, it spills over into Iraq, and Iraq becomes the big success, this, this Islamic state. And um, because of the bloody-mindedness of their activities, the violence and the anti-Shia, it's at this point that um, the mother load, so to speak, the bin Laden, what's left of the bin Laden organization in uh, Zawahiri, um, breaks relations and uh, too violent, too everything, out of control. But the point, that that's almost becomes an irrelevant point. This, this caliph draws on um, deep-seated Islamic themes. He comes from the family of the Prophet Muhammad. He establishes his legitimacy. And if you are a very fundamentalist, a very religious-minded, uh, religious per, uh, Sunni, or Shia for that matter, but we're talking about the Sunnis here, this is going to have some kind of important symbolism, descended from the Quraysh and the Hashemites, the family of the Prophet Muhammad. He's got all of the credentials. He trains as a cleric in Baghdad in the 1990s. He goes off to Afghanistan to fight. He's with Osama, comes back, and I'm just giving you some of his background. But um, he's clever, too, and he puts together this organization, and they're good at their tradecraft, they're good at their planning, and more to the point, and I don't know how big they are, you see estimates of everything from, what, 800, a couple thousand to 30,000 to, I don't know. I don't think anybody really does, but the point I want to make is they had help. They could not do what they did as quickly, as easily, um, as simply as it looks, without the help on the ground of, check off the following boxes, Iraqi Sunnis in exile and in in Iraq, but, excuse me, <laughs> de demarginalized, unhappy, and Maliki has pushed them over the edge. Maliki is, I think, I would give him at least 70% or more blame for things getting so out of hand and for making so many disastrous choices when he was warned what was coming. Um, he had help from local powerful tribes, prominent Sunni Arab leaders who Maliki was trying to arrest for treason. Uh, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. There's never been an amnesty in Iraq, remember. And national reconciliation, which is going to be my final, it's never been an option anyway. And Maliki, and if you have to look at who, and I'll come back to who he is, uh, but the point is the other supporters of uh, the caliphate, so to speak, not of the caliphate, but of this insurgency, um, prominent Bathist, ex-Bathist, still in exile. My favorite is card number six. Remember the deck of cards? Is that Ibrahim el Duri? He's the last, the very last of Saddam's innermost inner circle. He went into hiding. He, he's probably, I'll, I'll concede that he's probably still alive somewhere. But he was a Sunni, very religious man. Bathists were religious, excuse me, the press got that one wrong too. Uh, many, they, they eventually 
did wear beards maybe, but that wasn't the point. The point was that Saddam allowed religious expression in the 90s. He didn't have any choice whether he liked it or not. He himself was on a religious kick to gain, to retain political power. But the point is there's an army, including the army of the Naqshbandi, which is a Sufi religious order that is that Ibrahim is a leader of, so is Masoud Barzani. I'll come back to the Kurds. I've got to have time for this, <laughs> Yona. I'm sorry. It's complicated. And a lot of the different little militias, Sunni militias that were involved in 1905, 6, and 7, and it's nothing, they, they've always been around, they are back, and they have helped. They knew where things were, they knew where the nodes, security wise, what to attack, how to infiltrate who to go for, who is what. Iraq is not a big country. You know who's who and what's what, pretty much where you are, and you've got the people who have their roots there. And to be a tribal sheikh, I'll tell you, in northern Iraq is important. To be a tribal sheikh in the south among the Shia isn't such a big deal. There's no money, there's no pow much power involved. In the north, it's different. These are power brokers. And that's why I say if it were only about money, I'd feel relieved. But it's not. It's about power, it's about control, but I don't think it's about separatism. I don't think they want an independent state. In all of this, they have a view that they will be able to control the situation, that they, were, they are coming back, and that they will be able to get rid of the Islamists. ISIS, whatever, when they want to. I hate to use this analogy, but I'll simply remind myself that a lot of people in Germany thought that when Hitler was voted into power, and the rich, you know, robber barons, the industrialists who supported him, said the same thing, and then they, be, they were eaten by, by that regime. So anyway, just, you have to keep history in mind, sad to say. Uh, the tribes, uh, I've mentioned also. Now, you have all that kind of backing. Hey, you can, you can come in and do what they did and do it quickly, and you have street support. Little knowing what's going to happen next. And what we've seen is the eventual establishment of their version of Islamic law. No smoking, no drinking in public. Women must be covered. Stay home. Uh, there's a lot of rumors circulating out there, but the worst of this is you have to keep in mind this Islamic, this Islam, this Islamic state and caliphate. It's not about ethnicity. Wow, this is Iraq and it's not about ethnicity. It's everything about sectarianism. They don't care what kind of a Sunni you are. You're Kurdish Sunni? Fine. Turkmen Sunni? Great. Sunni, any kind of Sunni. But if you're a Turkmen Shia, you're dead. If you are a Kurdish Shia, I don't want to think what's going to happen to you. Shias are definitely not the flavor of the day or the month, and they are paying a price for it, a heavy price. They've been arrested, they've been executed, they've been forced into exile, and we're talking about the destruction of both the Shia and the Christian communities. The minorities have paid a terrible price and are paying it. The Christians were told, if you pay the special tax, this goes back to the early days of Islam, Special tax for, non, for the protected people, which the Christians and Jews of the old Islamic empires were. You pay a special tax, it's okay. First they were told to pay the special tax. Then they were told to convert. And they were told, get out now or else. And there are reports of crucifixions. There are reports of killings. A um, lot of refugees. Uh, 500,000 refugees from Mosul alone. So this is a major, and the destruction, because like the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia, I won't go further on that, uh, but they don't believe in shrines. That means you're worshipping a shrine, or you're worshipping the prophet Jonah, or you're wor worshipping some, uh, some, uh, some Islamic saint. There aren't any, and therefore everything about that must be destroyed. And is that what the Iraqis <coughs> want? I don't think so. It's not what anybody would want. Now, I think the question is, uh, that uh, some claim it, that part of U.S. strategy is to try to split this up, this coalition. And that would be a correct strategy. And maybe you can do it because we're seeing a lot of reports where there are, uh, maybe they're just feelers, but that these Sunnis are very worried and they're not happy with this. And there probably is a way if you could figure out to leverage it, but I don't know how you do that yet. Now, let me just go on to just a few other questions you might have because I had a little problem with a few things I heard. Let me, uh, the, the, first of all, the issue about Iran. I'm a little worried about that. Do I worry about Iran taking advantage of the situation now? No. You know why? They're already there. And they've been there since 2003. 
I don't subscribe to think that we got rid of Saddam in order to give Iraq to Iran, but we couldn't keep the Iranians out if we'd wanted to. 900 miles shared border, no border controls, and the Iranians have long been able now to come in, exercise control, influence, and authority. The question in my mind, speaking as somebody who's had to deal with intelligence and with the strategic view, is how do you turn that to your advantage? because you're not going to defeat it, and you're not going to be able to set it back. But you have to play on something else. And that's where I know I'm running out of time already. Of course. Well, we know that. Let me come back to Maliki at this point. Who is this Maliki? And like I said, I blame him because he's, I want to say he's stupid. It's not, it's not that. That's kind of a dumb, dumb response. He's clever, and he's cunning, and he's shrewd. He's conspiratorial. Why is he all these things? He's lived in exile for most of his adult life, more than 20 years. And he lived in Iran, and he lived in Syria, Mukhabarat states, police states. And he's learned to watch and watch for the Iraqis to come, for Saddam's people to come from. He thinks like a conspirator, and yeah, he does think like Saddam. In many ways, he sees the projection of power much in the same way that Saddam saw it. In this sense, you have to have a strong central state. Now, does he go so far as to say, I am the state? Well, it's, it's, it, it may look like that. It almost doesn't matter at this point. But I think he learned in exile uh, how to conspire and how to survive. He's not going to be an easy person to deal with. He's dangerous in this sense because all his thinking is in that direction. He, won, he made it very clear his intention was to, to finally exercise majoritarian rule. None of this, let's share the power with everybody else. Majority rule to him means I'm going to win that election. And they do have fairly fair, I have to say, elections in Iraq. Iraqis know what it means to vote, and that's not been the point. Uh, behind the scenes manipulation? Yes. Manipulation of the courts? Absolutely. And I think the comparison here to 2000 election in the United States is not quite so far-fetched if you think about it or you watched it from the outside. And I was in England at the time watching it from there. So... Uh, he doesn't like the Iranians. I'm convinced of that. He doesn't like the Syrians. But he's in a position where he has to look at what his options are and his choices. And frankly, no government in Iraq can ignore the Iranians or could look at what is happening in Syria and not see a threat should Assad collapse. Because if it happens there, for sure, the next move is Iraq. And he's seeing that already. I'm not defending him. I'm simply saying I do think he made a lot of wrong choices here, but you have to understand where he's coming from, and we don't. We talk about democracy, and I hate that word now, and a lot of other things, but we don't follow through, and we haven't been following through or understanding how do you deal with these problems. You might want to ask yourself when you think about U.S. policy, can we support the government in Baghdad, and we do support the government. Okay, it's, if it's going to be Maliki and he's elected, we're going to have much of a choice there, you might want to ask yourself. But if we do that, because we've got to defeat these extremists, can we do that without having a policy towards Syria as well? I just want to leave that out as a question. Now, um, let me conclude, because I know I've run out of time, and I don't want to abuse your good nature, Yona. Uh, will this issue go away? I don't think so. The ISIS, or whatever you want to call them, is not just a local phenomenon. It sees itself as a global phenomenon. It is talking about the caliphate worldwide. All Muslims are now told it is your obligation to come to Iraq and whether you come out to support the caliphate. Now, this is, a, this is the call. This is the dawah. This is the call. This is the obligation of all believing Muslims to do so. Now, there, is, uh, there are obligations like that in Islam, in history, and political tradition, whatever. Um, well, less than 1% may be even interested in that, but the point is, what are the other 99% doing? And I think that's part of the problem. Uh, will the Iraqis be able to solve it? I don't think they can. They certainly can't do it by themselves. So I, I raised the question about when you, who do you arm and how do you go about it without getting totally involved? There, I think that there are ways, but we're going to have to decide pretty quickly to have a policy, a clear policy, and, and move on this. I think, uh, and we can't pick the right ruler there. I do believe, and I know many Iraqis who would be great, open-minded, and I think uh, not governed by sectarian or 
ethnic, but would make Iraqi, because there is Iraqi nationalism. It's among the Shia. It is certainly among the Sunni who don't want to leave Iraq. They want to control it again or have, I think, a major say in power. It is a lot about leverage and control, and the only way they know to do it is by doing extremes because nothing else has worked. And in that sense, it is a little hard to argue. Now, I think there's opportunity here, but there's risk as well, and that's why I will close with this. We can't do it by ourselves. You can't have leverage but have nothing there to back it up with. I'm not just talking about troops on, boots on the ground, but we don't really, we have to back this up with something meaningful, but we also have to engage those who do have the leverage we lack. Leverage on the Shia, leverage on the Sunni, and you know who's leverage with everybody? Iran. Uh, Sunni politicians flock to Iran for support and protection and everything else, just like the Shia do. You don't know about the Sunnis doing that, do you? Well, they do. Even uh, the famous Ayat Alawi does. Uh, the Kurds all the time. Now, the point, again, is that uh, there are others like Iraq's Arab neighbors who have just sat on their hands and haven't done anything, especially the Gulf, the Gulf Arabs, especially the Saudis, who've just chosen for all of this time to ignore Iraq totally. And I and others have told the government, has told them many times, if you want to change the trajectory that you see for Iraq, if you don't want it to be a province of Iran or under Iranian control, it is an Arab country. You have to open up. You have to become more inclusive. You're going to have to talk to them for God's sake and not uh, say, well, we don't care and ignore the problem as if it's going to go away because it's not. And I think that there was a window of opportunity which could have maybe ameliorated some of this. But the point is that there are neighbors that have influence and there's Turkey. Now, when you look at what they want, I think I've said in closing what I thought the Sunnis wanted, which is not independence and separatism. I, I don't think anybody really knows, uh, and if there is a Kurdish rep here, that would be very nice. But the point I would like to make at this point is the Kurds are talking about independence. What they did, I think they did something unforgivable. They had the confederation that they wanted. When ISIS came, and they were warned, and they were warning people in Mosul, including the Turks, that there was a big threat coming. What did they do? They didn't live up to their obligations to fight for the Confederation or the state. They took their Peshmerga fighters and immediately occupied the disputed territories that they have with the government of Baghdad. Kirkuk and uh, large areas of uh, Nineveh and others, and they're keeping them. Now, some days Barzani, oh, we're going to vote, we're a referendum, we're going for independence. Good. And then other times there's hedging. Because I think in my heart of hearts that there's some kind of deal making that's been going on all the time. It may not be about money, but boy, do they deal. And my point was this. I think that Kurds had some kind of an understanding with ISIS not to attack each other. I think that's about over. They are starting to get attacked. ISIS wants those oil fields. And the Kurds want them, and they're going to fight over that. And ISIS is selling oil from the Iraqi and Syrian fields that has to the Kurds to be refined and exported, just like they're selling that oil to President Assad in Syria. Oh, that's nice. Um, but uh, losing control here. Um, what the Kurds want, it, it, I think they're looking for the best deal. They may be a little bit afraid. But oh, my final, that's where I am. The final power with influence, of course, is Turkey. And the Turks themselves have said two different things. And the Kurds, or the Kurds are interpreting what they hear easily to do two different ways. They support our independent state or they don't. I don't think the Turks themselves are really sure. They're part of a Turkish election ploy, but the point is the danger is there. Turks have helped ISIS to get into Iraq. Um, that wasn't too clever, but the point is you have to work with this as a regional problem. And there, in the testimony given this week at the House and Senate by the state coordinator for Iraq and the uh, undersecretary for policy, their emphasis was on a regional solution. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I accept to say that I think it does mean structuring something in part that does involve the neighbors in what is happening there, because without their help, we can't do it by ourselves. All right. That's it. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Judith.
after listening to you, especially because we do have so many uh, students here, um, I think uh, we need uh, not a semester but a full year to uh, clarify uh, the uh, complex situation in the Middle East. The question is who is who, who is a friend, who is a foe, and obviously we know nothing is constant in the affairs of international uh, situations, and uh, today enemies uh, become tomorrow's friend and vice versa. The key is interest. I won't go into it. I think we'll come back to many of the issues that you raised in general risk. I would like to move on, and I, before I do that, I would like to, uh, to welcome right here um, Ambassador Hosseini Al-Sharif, who is the ambassador of the Arab League in the United States. He was gracious to participate in some of our uh, other events. In fact, we just published saying you didn't get it yet, but you will. Um, your statement uh, related to the peace process in the Middle East, and certainly it is a contribution uh, in this uh, regard because uh, we, we have to decide whether the, the conflicts in the Middle East are endless or there are end games, and uh, we can deal with them. And of course, there are different uh, school of thoughts. One is uh, pessimistic in terms of the future, and one is optimistic. And in light of what's happening now in, in Gaza, I, I think we have to ponder the future with grave concern. So I would like to move on and to introduce uh, right, uh, Oren Marmonstein, who is presently a counselor for public and academic affairs at the Embassy of uh, Israel, and uh, he served before in Cairo uh, for a number of years uh, dealing with uh, political affairs uh, as well with uh, relations with Egyptian uh, political parties and the civic society and so forth. And um, I'm glad to see that he's a, a lawyer and graduate of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem uh, Law School. So, uh, Oren, uh, if you kindly come up here and um, try to present uh, the, the view to clarify some things and we'll develop a discussion later on. Hello everyone. As you can expect, uh, naturally I would like to focus mainly on the events happening nowadays in Gaza. But with your permission, I would like to um, expand the conversation a little bit more than uh, what we're witnessing at the daily news. And to go back a few years uh, in time, actually not too many years in time, and to give us a background. And what I'm referring to is uh, an event that happened less than a decade ago. I'm talking about the 2005 disengagement from Gaza. Because in the ongoing discussion <coughs> that is happening uh, in the daily press, uh, a lot of discussion is focusing on the current events, but the bigger picture, the bigger context, is sometimes being left out. So to begin with, in the year of 2005, when it comes uh, to the relations between Israel and Gaza, Israel has decided unilaterally to disengage completely from the Gaza Strip. And I want to remind us all that this wasn't uh, an easy and a smooth uh, decision in the sense of political decision in, in Israel. There was a lot of controversy that was uh, involved, a lot of uh, political uh, objection among uh, Israeli uh, political uh, spectrum. But nevertheless, the, the decision that was being made by the government was to withdraw from Gaza. And when I'm saying to withdraw from Gaza, it's in the most complete way that you can imagine. Settlements were uprooted. Civilians were be being taken out. By the way, some um, pictures that were coming out from there, you can see 
um, civilians trying to cling to the to their uh, communities and the police force and soldiers taking them out falsely because this was the decision being made by the Israeli government. And the bottom line is no settlement, no civilian, no Israeli soldier was left in the Gaza Strip whatsoever. Full stop. Nothing. And we need to remind us this because, you know, in, in the ongoing discussion, sometimes you come across those arguments, it's all because of the settlement. It's all because of the occupation. Those are very catchy phrases, but there's only one problem with it. It has nothing to do with reality. The fact of the matter is there is no occupation, there is no settlement, there, is no, there wasn't even one Israeli in the Gaza Strip beginning from the year 2005. And uh, my fellow speakers mentioned the economical aspect when it came to the discussion of Iraq. And I want to remind us all, back in the year of 2005, things looked quite optimistic. And uh, there were people saying that here this place, this coastal place called Gaza Strip, maybe could become the next Singapore. And there were uh, some philanthropists who were willing to allocate money to invest some serious funds in order to make Gaza a prosperous place. But as we all know, the events took a different uh, course. In the year of 2006, there were elections in Gaza, and then in 2007, a very violent takeover of Hamas, killing Fatah representatives, uh, some brutal clashes between Hamas and, and Fatah. At, and in the end of the day, Hamas is taking control of, of the Gaza Strip and just getting back to this hope, this economical hope or dream that Aza will become the next Singapore, what we were witnessing is Aza becoming a little Iran, a mini Iran just on our coast. So this is, again, this is not ancient history, but people tend to forget. This is less than 10 years ago. Now, if we fast forward in time, and we're getting into the recent events, we would find that Hamas, in recent, recent months, uh, is in a very problematic point. Different factors are the reason for this. First, it's Hamas' relationship with its old patron, with its, uh, one of its big supporters, Bashar al-Assad, that uh, used to uh, support uh, Hamas with uh, weapons and, and uh, uh, money. The relationship between Hamas and, uh, and uh, Assad uh, got into a very problematic uh, uh, situation, and Hamas lost much of its uh, backing at a certain point of uh, time coming from uh, Assad. Second, there is the relationship between Hamas and Egypt. After the current events, and I don't know, maybe we'll have some time to discuss what's happening in Egypt. Uh, I have a soft spot, uh, like you mentioned, for Egypt. I fell in love with the country. Uh, I was posted there during the time of the Egyptian Revolution. So I had a chance to watch the events during the Mubarak era, during the revolution, and a little bit after. So on a, on a personal note, it was a, a really an amazing experience. But when it comes to the, to the relationship between uh, Hamas and Egypt, Hamas, again, is in a very problematic uh, spot because um, the good and tight relationship that it had with the Muslim Brotherhood is now being held against it. And the, um, the Egyptian uh, administration is now fully addressing the um, issue of smuggling coming from uh, the Sinai Peninsula to the Gaza Strip. So this is another element. And of course, much of it adds up to the issue of money. Hamas is being left out with very little money on his, uh, on his behalf. And just add to this 
this recent event of the kidnapping of the three teens, three Israeli Jewish teens that were abducted by uh, Hamas. As you all know, um, Hamas terrorists kidnapped those three teenagers and they killed them right away. And by the way, this is a, a quite shocking uh, uh, piece of uh, information to hear that you, when you listen to it on live, but what happened is that during the abduction, one of those uh, teenagers managed to call the 911 uh, line. Uh, there was a problem that the, the person on the other line didn't hear what he was saying, but uh, the bottom line is that you hear the, the entire episode that is happening in the car. And you get a glimpse that what's happening there and the terrorists are uh, shouting and them put your hands down and then you hear the, the shots. So the, the fact of the matter that Hamas killed those three teens immediately and their idea was to negotiate with Israel uh, the release of uh, Hamas prisoner. That's their, their idea of the operation. But what happened is that Israel managed to get to the bodies of those three teens before Hamas even started the negotiation. So the entire episode was useless, and uh, because of this uh, terrorist attack, Israel uh, launched a campaign to arrest terrorists of Hamas that, that were released in the Gilad Shalit deal and came back to terrorist activity. Because if you look at the agreement that followed the Gilad Shalit uh, deal, it was said quite clear that if those terrorists are to return to terrorist activity, Israel holds the right to uh, arrest them. And that's what happened. So the Palestinian uh, society, the Palestinian street, was quite enraged by Hamas because what they were saying, you guys are just putting us into more trouble. You're not getting prisoner released and you're just complicating everything. So in this background, with this background, Hamas decides to uh, start firing uh, at Israel. And by saying start firing, it's not 100% uh, uh, accurate because Hamas was all the time firing, but it, uh, after this episode of uh, kidnapping the, the three teens, Hamas decided to escalate the flames. And I'm talking about events happening prior to Operation Protective Age. By the way, if we're referring to, to uh, the media discussion, this wasn't part of the media discussion. But I can tell you on, on a, a personal note, I just came back from uh, Israel last Sunday. My parents-in-law, sitting in, in their uh, living room, uh, watching World Cup, this is what the most Israeli men do during the months of the uh, World Cup, and they were, uh, they, they heard this uh, alarm uh, going off. So my, uh, uh, my mother-in-law asked my uh, father-in-law, what is this noise that uh, we're hearing? My father-in-law answers, no, this is nothing. This is the crazy fans. They are uh, doing this noise uh, in the television. Uh, and, and my mother-in-law answers, no, you're talking nonsense. And of course, my father-in-law doesn't take it seriously because this is what she usually tells him, that he's talking <laughs> nonsense. You know those conversations. But, but to make a long story short, after, only after a few seconds, both of them realize that the siren goes off and they're ru running into a, sh to a shelter. And this happening, you, you never heard about this episode, not because it was in my parents-in-law uh, living room, because it wasn't part of the conversation, but this was happening in hundreds of houses of Israeli families in southern part. This, uh, they, they are living in, in uh, Be'er Shiva. So this is the background when we're coming to, to discuss Operation Protective Edge. The main idea was to restore peace and quiet to the people of Israel and to restore the, 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 the same uh, sense of normal uh, uh, living that every person here in the States uh, uh, enjoys. And the idea was to restore it, and we tried to restore it. First, through diplomatic channels. I don't know if you remember this, but it's, again, it's, it's important to mention those facts. Before launching Operation Protective Edge, the Israeli government sent 
in the very clearest way possible. Quiet will be answered with quiet. We will not retaliate. If Hamas will hold its fire, we will not react. We said it once, we said it again, it didn't work. Hamas continued firing. And then we were forced to go into this operation, first to stop this rocket firing. It's more than 2,000 rockets that are being fired at Israel. Think of it, it's two-thirds of the country. Two-thirds of the country is in bomb shelters, and I, I mentioned in my visit to Israel, I can tell you that this is a, ver a, a very um, a unpleasant situation in which you put your baby to sleep, and after two hours you wake her up, my 17-month-old uh, baby Danielle, and you rush her to the, uh, to, the, to the shelter. And this is not happening one night. It's happening almost every night. And we're trying to stop it, and like I said, we tried to stop it, peace with, uh, quiet with quiet, it didn't work, and then came the Egyptian ceasefire proposal. Israel almost immediately said yes, trying to opt out of this operation. But Hamas rejected it and continued firing at our cities. But it's not only the uh, Egyptian ceasefire, by the way, that was being adopted but by many Arab countries. And Mr. Ambassador, the, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think the, the Arab League also adopted the Egyptian uh, ceasefire. Many Arab countries, the European community, the United States, they all adopted the Egypt Egyptian <coughs> uh, ceasefire, as did Israel, and Hamas continued to reject this offer. But then came along a UN call for a ceasefire. Just holding the fire for a few hours, that's what the UN was trying to do. Israel said yes, but Hamas continued to fire them. And there was a third proposal offered by the Red Cross. Again, Israel said yes, again, Hamas continued to fire. So, I think it, it's important to, 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 to be aware that in every junction, is it trying to opt out of escalating the situation? And when Hamas is keep drawing us to this, uh, to this battle, we were presented by a different and a new challenge, a new threat. We talked about those rockets. This time we are being uh, challenged by a threat called terrorist tunnels. Now those tunnels are not, if I may, it's not the Shoshnik Re Redemption the movie tunnels. You know, <laughs> it's not something that you, you dig with a spoon. Those are industrial tunnels. And they go all the way, all the way from Gaza Strip all the way to Israeli soil. Again, this is, it has nothing to do with Gaza. It goes to kibbutz you know, those communities that we have in Israel, all the way to the, to, the, uh, to the gates of the kibbutz. And the idea of Hamas is to use those tunnels, and we know it because we had squads of terrorists coming out of those tunnels, 13 uh, uh, terrorists in a one episode coming out of them, and they were uh, intercepted by Israeli uh, troops. And we found in their... Uh, equipment, tranquilizers, and handcuffs. So those people weren't coming to sightseeing. They were coming to abduct and to take hostages. And it turns out that basically there is Gaza and there is underground Gaza. There is a world of tunnels that Hamas has dug in order to um, allow him more option of attack towards Israel. And just to give you a, a, a sense, some argue that it costs roughly $1 million to build this tunnel. Now think what can have been done, we were talking again about economy, what can have been done with $1 million? Already there were 30 tunnels exposed, and who knows how many more. 
think what can have been, have been done with all those uh, funds. What can have been done with this concrete that is used to, to build tunnels? Instead of building schools and building uh, hospitals and infrastructure, Hamas is using this money and this material to, boot, to, to build its uh, terrorist infrastructure. Now, before wrapping it up, I want to touch on a very uh, important uh, issue that I think it's part of the discuss discussion, but I think it's, it's not being fully discussed. And I'm talking about the pictures coming out from Gaza. Those are hard pictures. There's no other way to describe hard pictures coming out of, uh, of Gaza. But again, having this conversation with an educated uh, uh, group, one must realize that this is part of a deliberate <coughs> strategy of Hamas. It's not by accident or by coincidence that we come across those pictures. And this strategy has a name. It's called Human Shield. Hamas, I'm not talking about the, the, the war crime Hamas is doing and committing towards uh, Israelis targeting Israeli civilians. I'm talking about the fact that Hamas is committing war crime to its own people, to the people of Gaza, putting putting missiles and rockets in schools, in a UN school. Just this week, two episodes in which in a UN school, in one UN school, UNRWA was the agency, it's an agency operating in the Gaza Strip. In one UN school, they found more than 20 rockets. You know, the Prime Minister said it, I think, in the clearest way. We have this system an amazing system um, called Iron Dome. I would say it's almost rocket science, but it is rocket science. <laughs> it's it's, it's a, a system that is um, by the support of, of America, and we're grateful for this support, allow Israel to address this challenge of being fired at from Gaza. So we are using this system, this missile system, to protect our civilians. And what Hamas is doing, they are using the civilians to protect their missiles. It's the exact opposite. So they are using schools to, to hide uh, missiles. They are using hospitals as headquarters. They are firing at us from uh, hospitals. They are using mosques. We know of cases that those terrorist tunnels are coming out from a mosque. And it's even more to it because we know that before Israel is operating in a specific uh, uh, area, Israel is trying to uh, alarm and to inform the, the, the civilian population so they will be out of harm's way. And we know for a fact that Hamas is telling the Gaza people not to leave the, those areas. There is this uh, uh, video of uh, Hamas uh, Minister of uh, Interior, and he's saying on camera, we're telling uh, the, the citizens not to go out of their home. And you need to understand, and generals, you, you are much of aware of the uh, uh, army operation. I'm not aware, and, and maybe the, uh, there was this, uh, there were cases like this in the, in, the, in the past, but I'm not aware of so many efforts, so many attempts made by modern army to try to prevent, to refrain from harming civilians. And I'm talking about leaflets that are being spread to civilians. I'm talking about text messages sending text messages to, to private cellulars. And by the way, not just general messages, telling them exactly which neighborhoods they should go to because those, are na no, those neighborhoods are safe, are not part of the fire zone. Calling people. 
I want to share with you something that I just saw yesterday. It's an amazing video. You see, you see this uh, um, scene coming out of a battle happening in Gaza. And in this scene, you see Israeli troops come across the fire that is being fired them. And uh, in the radio communication, they are being asked, do you identify where, is the f where are they firing you at? Where, where are they firing from? And they said, yes. And this is from this building. And you see the building, and it's a hospital. It's Wafa Hospital. So they are being identified as firing from the Wafa Hospital. And you see it on camera. And the other part of this movie is even more amazing. You hear this uh, audio conversation between an Israeli soldier calling this hospital. And he's saying, hello, I'm calling from the Israeli soldiers. You are firing at us. Can you, can you do something about it? And he's telling the other person, you must be aware that according to international law, if you are firing at us from a civilian infrastructure, hospital, school, we are entitled to fire back. That's self-defense. Self so the guy is asking him, can you verify that there are no civilians in this building? Can you make sure that there are no patients in the hospital? And he's calling, and the, 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 the Palestinian is telling, telling him, no, there are no uh, patients here. And he's calling in again, and he's saying, just we want to make sure because we, will f we want to fire back. And, ag and again, this is, to me, was mind-boggling because I can't see, you don't see it in the movies, that the, 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 the guy in the, uh, in the army is calling the other guy and saying, is it convenient to, uh, for you so I fire back? It's, it's something <laughs> mind-boggling. But this is, this is what's happening in, in Israel right now. The, the bottom line is this, and, and by the, uh, with this I, I would like to conclude. Like I said, Hamas started this round of fire because their own political problems trying to achieve political gain. They are doing so in the most cynical way, not only regarding Israeli population, but also regarding Palestinian population. What we are trying to do right now is to restore quiet. We try to do it through diplomatic channels. There are still talks about diplomatic channels. If it's not working through diplomatic channels, we'll do it through military channels. But the bottom line is that we will restore peace and quiet to the people of Israel, but also to the people of Gaza. Thank you. Thank you, Owen, for presenting the Israeli view. Uh, as an academic institution, obviously uh, we are impartial about uh, the conflicts around the world and uh, the, mm, I think, mission of the academic community is to uh, learn the lessons of the past, what worked, what didn't work, and how to anticipate uh, future threats, and more importantly, how to advance the cause of peace with justice throughout the world. And the Middle East obviously is no exception. Now, in planning this event, I want to make sure that for the record, uh, we invited you as an Israeli. We also invited a Palestinian representative, and he agreed to uh, participate and confirm that, unfortunately, late yesterday, um, he called that he cannot come for whatever reason, and I'm not going to speculate. So uh, to rescue, I think, uh, the situation and to broaden it from the point of view of uh, intelligence and uh, the consequences in the region, um, we invited uh, Judith, and we're very grateful again to you, Judith, for your uh, response and uh, commitment to scholarship. So what I would like to do now is uh, to invite anyone who would like to uh, make a statement or to uh, ask a question uh, Ambassador Sharif, I, I see you and I know that you are 
a saving uh, angel because you were prepared to also assist us in clarifying the complex situation before and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for taking time out of your very busy uh, schedule and certainly we're interested in uh, the position of the Arab League or in general uh, to present some insights in order to clarify the situation. Would you kindly come up here? Of course. Welcome. Alan Rizalan. Thank you, Alexander. And I thank you very much indeed uh, for allowing me. I think this is the second or third time. Right. And I find myself always, I, or I found myself always in a position of uh, trying to clarify many fallacies. This is, I think, it's my destiny or my luck. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the, you said that uh, a Palestinian has come. This is unfortunate, uh, very unfortunate. Uh, here is an open country that we should be there always. Why not? It's, uh, you allowed me to speak, although I know you don't agree with me, but you gave me the opportunity, and I like it, and I appreciate that. Our views are different, I know, but it doesn't matter. You gave me really the opportunity on several occasions to clarify some points. If I am wrong, don't take it, but it's my duty to tell you the truth, and only the truth, and you don't have, by the way, to be a Palestinian in order to talk about the Palestinian suffering or disaster. You just have to be an, a normal human being. You don't have to be any other nationality or any other religious or sectarian just to be a human being. Uh, I really don't know from where to start to clarify the fallacies of one of the last speakers. Uh, <laughs> let me see. I don't know. I wrote so many. I didn't, was not prepared to that. I thought the Palestinian will take over. Uh, anyway, uh, he said that always, he repeated many times, Hamas killed, killed, killed the kidnapped soldiers. They did not kill, and Israelis didn't find out that they killed by Hamas. They found them killed, but they didn't know who killed them. This is the truth. Okay, now, Hamas has nothing to do with the kidnapping of those three. Otherwise, they would have admitted it, and they would have not killed them. They, could, they would have kept them to bargain for as usual, for uh, release of prisoners and so on. But that's why they are the last one to kill them. And yet there are ones who suffered, but Israel attacked Gaza, although Gaza did not kill them. Hamas did not kill them. Israel didn't admit it even. But they said Hamas when they found out later that they were killed somewhere else. And that's what triggered Hamas rockets attack. It's not that true. It's not true. What triggered Hamas, what triggered Israeli attack, really, the, 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 um, uh, the Gaza is that as one a Jewish American, I, by the way, I, I like not to talk myself because you might think I am biased, and I have no reason to be unbiased, but I will quote some Jewish American writers and politicians and generals, and then I leave it to you, either to believe them or to not to believe them. A Jewish American by the name of Nathan, there are many Nathans here, but I think in the New York Times you find his name. He wrote in the New York Times recently that Israeli assault on Gaza was not triggered by Hamas rocket directed at Israel, but by Israel's determination to, be, uh, to bring down the Palestinian unity government that was formed in the early June, even though that government was committed to honoring all of the conditions imposed by international community for recognition of its legitimacy. Uh, I have to commend the heroic resistance of a group, not a country, not even a semi-country, which are the Gazans. They resisted against a superpower who is supposed to be the most powerful nation in the area and maybe the fourth in the world. And yet, they couldn't manage their airports. They couldn't secure their borders. This event, what happened now in Gaza, broke the myth of security. 
Last time, if you remember, Alexander, I said, Israel said, one of some of the Israelis, I quoted. I always quote them, really. I take, because there are many honest Israelis and many brave Israelis who can say the truth. I said that many Israelis said that we have never been secure in 60 years as we are secure now. Why? Because of the turmoil and the chaos in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, and those are three important countries for peace or for war. Anyway, so here is a power, uh, here is Israel who the United States has committed to keep it stronger than all the Arab countries combined at any time, at any price. And yet, they could not secure themselves. And this broke the myth of security of any power anywhere in the world. No one is secure. Gaza is very close, just a few miles, few, few, few meters from Israel. What, what kind of security? With the Iron Dome that was done, that was, that was given freely, gift to Israel. It couldn't. And now they are giving another one, double even, to secure Israel. And it will not work. And this peace is secure. A just peace is secure. Uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, he said that Assad, <laughs> the problem, he said that Assad was supporting Hamas. Imagine, and he forgot that the United States is supporting Israel with all its power, with three billion a year from the taxpayer Americans, with all the weapons it needs at any time, at any risk, at any, at, at any price. He forgot all of that, and only Hamas and Assad. Assad doesn't have the money or the weapon to support Hamas. And if he supported it, it's nothing compared to what Israel has. Israel should have, the, should have the power, all the power. But yet, those people, group, not a state, they broke the power, the superpower, which I feel really, I feel really amazed at how did they do it with all the tunnels, with all of these to defend themselves. And here, I, I tell you, I was attending a, a, a breakfast the other day, and the president, and by the way, this country allows me to speak freely, which is good, and I recommend that, and I would like to, tell, to quote him, to quote the president. President Obama said, uh, sorry if I want, yeah, maybe the audience don't like it, but I would like them to let me continue, if I, because there are points really I should clarify. President Obama said during the iftar that Israel has, has the right to defend and protect their civilian population from assaults from across their borders. Here, their borders, he said. Look at this one. Here, Mr. Sigmar, I don't want to comment. I will, I will quote you a Jewish American again. He said, Mr. Sigmar asked, actually not said, but where exactly are Israeli borders? It is Netanyahu's refusal to identify this border that placed Israeli population at risk, at risk. Just for this is a, he, he said it, not me. I mean, now there are 800 Palestinians killed by Israeli defense forces. The overwhelming majority, because the Israelis could not get the resistance, 80 percent of them, of those 800 today or more, maybe now they are they are 900 by the time I speak to you. Most of the 80 percent of them are civilians, children, and women and perhaps 20% are combatants. So let's be frank about it. And Gaza, by the way, has been for many years. Imagine, if you are under blockade, if you are under occupation, and you and your family and uh, the houses are demolished over your head, and for 60 years you are under occupation, and Gaza, per se, is an open air, uh, the largest open air prison on earth. I didn't say it. It's the Prime Minister of England who said it, Cameroon, when I was in Turkey, Ambassador of Saudi Arabia. He said it, not me. This is the largest prison. And you want the, 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 the people, the Palestinians in Gaza to stay, either do nothing? Just ask, I ask you this question. You, you kill my parents, you take my land, you occupy my land for many years, and then you, 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 you are, you, I am under siege for those years, and this I, 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 I sleep and wait for you to come in. I hug you. I don't think you will hug him or hug them. This is, I attended the other day, 
a few months ago, a soldier who, who is defected from the, with 1,000 or more Israeli soldiers from Israeli army because of what's going on. His name is uh, Avinar. He's uh, uh, one of the group of break the silence, breaking the silence. I was listening to him. He said that we were allowed to kill any Palestinian who has a binocular in the window or a mobile. He's a sniper, by the way, and he's a very smart uh, soldier. Uh, he was, uh, so he's, uh, uh, and then he said one day when there is a match in the Europe, European League, we go to a Palestinian house who has a satellite, we lock them in the door in the basement and we watch the match and the soldiers leave and leave them in that basement. God knows who will open the basement. Anyway, I asked him a question. I told him, Mr. Uh, Abinir, tell me wh what makes you kill a Palestinian who's not a threat to you? Is it your training? Or is it your uh, uh, education or what? And he took other three or four questions. He answered the three or four questions. My, my question was the fifth. He didn't answer. By the way, many of the people, maybe some of you were there here, were Jewish American who asked him, they told him, you answer the Arab League question. He said, Mr. Ambassador, I don't have a, convinc a convincing or a good answer for you. Just you have to think of it. I told him, thank you. If you don't have, I understand why. Okay, this is just to give you one example under the pressure and the disaster and the chaos, the chaos situation of the, of the Palestinian, and yet they want, uh, they want them to be silent and accept all this power. I mean, it's really a shame to have a power like this doing all of that, killing 80% uh, 80, 80 of the 800 or 900 by now, I think, to, uh, by this, at this moment. And then they want them to surrender and be, what, is that? What, what, what kind of peace? What kind of, uh, of, of and, and this, by the way, this is a country who, is, who claims of human rights, dignity, and a member of the United Nations, a member of many organizations. The Hamas is not a member of any organization. They are only a group and did what they did. They should be ashamed, those who are attacking them from Israel by planes, by rockets, by everything, by, by bombs, by uh, tanks. They, they don't have only clash and call. And there was a time it was only stones. And this is what they did. Uh, there are, uh, oh, he said that, yeah. They said that, <laughs> oh my God, I don't know what to say. He said that the Israel uh, left, uh, left Gaza, uh, I mean, just uh, as a gift. They gave it to the Palestinians, or as a favor. It's not. Israel was a burden economically and security-wise. They wouldn't have left it. And they haven't left it free. It was seized all the time since that day up to now. Yes, it's under siege. And he says that he gave, they left it as a favor to them. It's not at all. They are still, the Palestinian in Gaza is under siege for many years, blockaded. And the only, as I told you, Cameron said it, the Prime Minister of England, that this is the largest prison, open air, prison on earth. I was in uh, Turkey when he said it. Uh, just one last point, if you... I think that's enough. I will stop there. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador for trying to clarify the, your, your personal position uh, and the Arab League and, and so on. And I, I think this uh, gives us an opportunity to develop a dialogue which hopefully would lead perhaps to uh, some sort of opportunity for uh, ceasefire and perhaps uh, further negotiations for a peace that would bring security, prosperity to all concerned. Uh, before I open it up, I, I think I have an obligation as moderator to uh, give the opportunity to uh, the panelists. Would you, yeah, would you kindly, uh, would you come up here? Well, uh, of if course. he says some policies, if he doesn't, I will not. Okay. Of course. I mean, you know, we're academics. 
Uh, and it's not the end yeah. of get, scholarship, it's the beginning. It's too complicated for me, i got to get this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in good spirit, and I, I'm uh, grateful for this dialogue. First, I would like to relate, Mr. Ambassador, if I may, to the very... Can I... Ah, there's a record there. Yeah, that's okay. It's okay? Sharon, she's in charge. Okay. When in doubt, add Sharon. Okay. It's not the CIA. No, no, we have the CIA in the table. Mr. Ambassador, if I may, just to relate to a couple of the points. First, uh, I think your last point was regarding uh, the so-called siege on Gaza. Now, we know that that's a big myth. You know, we've been uh, hearing this quite a long, many times. If I may, I just want to give you some f facts, just figures. On the day of 24 of, uh, 24 of July, this is two days ago, in Kerem Shalom, this is one of the crossings uh, coming to Gaza, 111 trucks came in Gaza with medicine and food, 360,000 liters of solar, 270,000 liters for a, a warming, and a 250 ton of gas. Today, last figures from today, I just got the figures before coming here. In Kerem Shalom, 71 trucks with medicine and food supply, 330 liters of solar, one, 132 ton of gas. This is what's coming to Gaza during this time of violence. Trucks are coming in with supply. So I heard this myth, it's a blockade, it's, it's, a, it's a siege. It's not connected to the reality. Trucks are coming into Gaza. And by the way, don't take the word of a policy uh, a uh, distributor like myself, Google it and uh, search for it for yourself. Google for uh, quotes by Khalil Khaya, who is the uh, man in Hamas who is responsible for their uh, foreign affairs. Google for the quotes of Ismail Radwan, who used to be uh, Hamas minister of Waqf, the holy places. Those two gentlemen of Hamas said in the clearest way, there is no blockade on Hamas. Now, one last pause, because I think we can uh, go back and forth uh, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, you, you mentioned um, some quotes of uh, uh, Israeli uh, soldiers, Jewish soldiers. Uh, Israel pride itself being a democracy, by the way. Uh, I have friends that are on the very left part of the uh, Israeli politics uh, spectrum, friends that are part of the po uh, right uh, political spectrum, uh, but I can tell you that there is a big consensus that what's happening now in Gaza is Hamas to blame. And you know, uh, Mr. Ambassador, if I'm not mistaken, the Arab League is, is placed in, in Cairo, so allow me to um, quote a person that I think you would hold reliable, and you would uh, hold the, uh, his quote, and I'm referring to Egypt foreign minister. <laughs> and Egypt foreign minister, and I just Google it so I have the very exact wording. Egypt foreign minister, Mr. Samech Shukri, said, this is a quote, had Hamas accepted the Egyptian proposal, it could have saved the life of at least 40 Palestinians. This is Samar Shukri, the foreign minister of, of Egypt. And again, if I'm not mistaken, it was the opinion and the, the approach of the Arab League itself that the Egyptian ceasefire should be adopted. So I think there is a very large consensus that the violence needs to be stopped. The problem is that so far, and for those of you who have listened to Khaled Mashal 
in the last speech, the problem is that Hamas so far has continued to reject any proposal for a ceasefire. Thank you. I told you, if he, if he does, I will go. I can stay here. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I have no, I have no problem. <laughs> I have no problem, although I am fasting, but I think fasting helped me to reveal everything. <laughs> we have two minutes. Okay. With pleasure. No, you can speak as long as you want. No, you can't. Three speak. minutes. No, I, he, he doesn't need No, no, if two minutes, I will go no, back. No, 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 no. No, no, I'm joking. I will, I will not take time. Yeah. But just to talk about democracy. If everybody thinks that Israel is democracy. I have never seen a democracy that killed so many people. I never heard a democracy that occupied other people's land for many years. What kind of democracy? Up to now. They are, they are even, they know that they are not democratic completely with all the aid and support of, this, of, of the United States. The United States know that they are not democratic. They know what kind of democracy. And they are worried. They don't, they, they don't, know, they don't know what to do. A two-state solution or one-state solution? Or they will end up undemocratic. One-state solution, will, the majority will be Palestinian, soon or later. And then, they will not, if they allow them to vote, a Palestinian will be a head of state of, state of Israel. If they if they allow to if they if they don't allow them then will be it, it will be it will be Jewish but not democratic or democratic but Jewish or or, or non-democratic but Jewish so what they don't know what to do what to want they want the land the cake and eat it and then and then he says that it's democratic what what kind of democracy and he never by the way he didn't comment on any issue I I, I maybe I took I tackled ten or eleven or twelve issues he took only one issue he doesn't have anything to say. I know it, and I'm not saying anything fallacy or, 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 or lies, because it's all. He said, you have to Google this, Google that. Yes, Google, so what? But there are many Israelis who are, you are, you are right. You said democracy, you have democracy. No, not democracy. You have Israelis who are honest. Yes, that's true. And I talk to them, and I meet them. I don't mind. I have now no problem. But those who, are, who kill other people and like, and who are fanatic, Zionists are the problem. This is the problem, and this is what's going on there in that area. I have never seen somebody who burn a young boy till death. He cannot be a human being at all. Thank you. In less than two minutes. Shall I go? I finish the two minutes. Yeah, okay. You're perfect, Mr. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I think, obviously, uh, if I can make a comment. No, please. You know, obviously, uh, you know, we have several schools of thought. On, on what's <laughs> happening, uh, not just the, not just the, uh, in the Gaza problem, but really in the whole region, and uh, and seriously, it points out to me again that uh, what a difference there appears to be between uh, between what the United States thinks is going on and what we think the challenges are and what we think are possible solutions, as opposed to. Uh, the view in, uh, for example, Turkey, uh, who, which is a totally different view uh, with respect to the current issues. Uh, what's going on in, in the, elsewhere in the Middle East, uh, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And it, uh, it really has bothered me because uh, I don't think uh, we have it uh, all right either. And uh, I don't think some of the other nations and, and spokesmen do either. And, and how do you how do you get it to get, how do you really get to the bottom of of, uh, of the issues here and come up with some practical uh, solutions uh, for uh, for peace and prosperity? A um, couple of things I do know: the Palestinian people want peace. Uh, the Israeli people want peace. Uh, most of the other uh, thinking people around the world. Uh, want peace, and yet uh, we don't seem to be uh, any closer to achieving that now than we have been uh, for years and years and years. And so it, it really is uh, troublesome, and I, I always uh, I perk up when I hear people think they have the solution, because I don't think there is the solution. I think that it's going to take a compromise. It's going to take people willing to uh, to think uh, in a different uh, view uh, about what has to happen, and uh, and uh, while while most people think negotiations 
are, uh, don't have a chance. I happen to think that negotiations really are the only solution to these kinds of challenges, and I'll shut up. No, you can continue. That's no, fine. No. No, okay, but it's you you will come back. It's after two you, o'clock. You, I mean, you know, we started a little bit uh, late, <laughs> so uh, as a keeper of the time, General, would you like to make some comments on this or others? Or? Three thoughts. Okay. Take me thirty seconds. Middle East is like a bar fight right now. Nobody knows who started it, and nobody knows. Okay, but at this point, let's get let's quit fighting and go back to having a beer and trying to meet a girl. <laughs> there's, many, there's many future fighters that are being created out of this. Third thing, watch the mutations. The mutations are dangerous people. And that's, uh, that's a little bit of ISIS, in my opinion, and some of the crazies who are going to be spawned from some of this other thing. And if you think we got troubles now, you wait until you see the people who have been hated and dumped on, even more so that's been done in the past. We're in for, we're in for hell. And everybody looks at the problem like a nail. We've got to stop hitting it with a hammer, as the boss said. Thanks, Joan. Thank you, General. Judith? Uh, you know, after that, what could one say? If beer and girls are his solution, <laughs> I'm out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the analogy. I don't know. Right. You've got to change your terms of reference. <laughs> Sorry, it's part of the problem here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I will open it up for some discussion. Um, Mike Kraft, a former S Department of State expert on terrorism in Congress. Would you, would you speak you. to the mic, please? Thank you. I have a, a broad question for uh, our Iraq and Egyptian watchers and you two as a Turkish watcher, but first from a counterterrorism viewpoint, I much, without going into a lot of detail, I must say, that those who excuse terrorist attacks uh, and acquiescent and just help encourage more terrorism and shouldn't be surprised if governments take some kind of countermeasures. Uh, my broader question is this, and I go back to 1967 war when I was on the Middle East desk in London and UPI when this big organization was handled with material coming in. And, and what intrigues me, and I want to pick up on Dr. Yaffe's comment about you have to be more inclusive and the general referred to this a bit with you know, Maliki. It seems to me as a non-expert, one of the difficulties, especially in Iraq, is the unwillingness of Maliki, for one reason or another, to be inclusive. In Egypt, we've seen the swings between you know, the Mubarak government, the Muslim Brotherhood, and now the military government, and not being terribly inclusive at all. And in Turkey, Aragon you know, tried to push things through, through the throat to the secular 49.5% who didn't vote for him, and this lack of inclusivity. And I think it also may be applying in, in the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. The ambassador may forget, but after the 67 war, um, the Arab League um, voted three no's when the Israelis uh, made offers to try to, leave, to uh, withdraw from uh, the West Bank and Gaza, and they said no negotiations, no recognition, uh, no, no peace. Um, and certainly Hamas is not being inclusive and it calls for the destruction of the state of Israel. So I wonder how much of this may be psychological. You know, Sadat once said 90% of the Middle East is, is psychology of it. Um, I think he was talking in context you know, purely of the, uh, the dispute. But how much do you think is maybe cultural, the difficulty of, you know, the Iraqis uh, and some of the other groups to really take a more, um, what in the West we might consider willingness to be pragmatic and, and uh, you know, accept compromises or half loaves. Thank you. Well, <coughs> okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me anyway, right. Um, I don't like using the cultural kind of thing because to say cultural means that, well, some people just like to kill others or some people just can't be democratic or don't know how to play with other kids. It's not in their culture. And I'm not sure that's true, but I do think that um, in inclusiveness was not an option except for us. We wanted inclusion. We thought it was important. 
We had a mathematical formula for it in 2003, and then we were accused of creating sectarianism in Iraq, which was absurd because it's been there for a long time, and in many ways it always will be. You have sectarianism in this country. I'm proud of what I am, and it's not what the mainstream is, and that's, you know, I'm, an, I'm entitled to that, and, but it's, 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 part, it's part of the problem that it's not accepted, or you, to get that kind of entitlement in this region is not yet allowing the entitlement for everyone else. I'll put it short. Winners, as we know, write the peace terms. Winners write the constitutions. Winners write the histories and set the terms. And in this case, the winners in Iraq were Kurds and Shia, who sided with the U.S., uh, and they had their own religious and ethnic agendas. And what we've seen is there was no way that we were able or willing, and I think a lot of it had to do with willing, was to, uh, to try to redirect that. National reconciliation was never an option for the Iraqis, at least not for those in power and those in control. There were those who did and who had practiced that, but they've never been able to have the opportunity to have the power to do anything. But I don't think it's a cultural thing. Again, if it were, then this would not have been a tradition and a culture which was tolerant, at least of the peoples who are out of power now, tolerant of each other, tolerant of Christians and Jews. Uh, not equal. I'm not talking about equality. I'm just talking about a tolerance and a, an ability to live. So that's, that was cultural, too. And Iraq had that. That's where I feel disappointed because I believed in that. Hmm? Yeah. And I think that there are many who do, but you don't, you're not going to see it. And this is a polarized environment, not so much different from what's happening in Israel where there are no centrists. You either are with us or against us. And believe me, I know that battle within my own family very all too painfully. It's one of the reasons I don't do Israeli-Palestinian. <laughs> not totally stupid. Um, but uh, it's there. Um, and I think it will be again. But uh, not now. Please. Of course, we made mistakes, the Arab League and others. And the Israeli now will make mistakes. It would regret that it didn't accept Kerry's peace plan. It wouldn't have happened, this one. And this problem will be augmented and it will lead to other difficult situation for Israel. At, at least it broke the myth of Israel. We thought that it, it's under, nobody can defeat it. We thought so. But it's only a group of people did what they did. They regret that they didn't accept. We regret that maybe many Arabs do regret at that time, 1967, 1948, there were some ideas they wouldn't accept. Yes. If you go back to history, yes, that's correct. Because it depends on that time, that situation. How was it? Did Israel get the more land, best, uh, best land? That's why the Arabs didn't accept it. Was the Arabs felt that it's unfair for the Palestinian? Maybe the Palestinian didn't accept it because it's not the Arabs only. The Palestinians also have a say in that. So it's really, you can go back to history and say, yes, you made a mistake here and there. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but this is what happened. Even the Israelis, I told you, they regret what happened, that Kerry plan would not, did not. Yeah, it's very complicated. I tell you, Abbas anyway is not very popular in the, in, among his own people. It's a democratic again, as, 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 as he said. He's a democratic country, but you know, the people have their own opinion also. Sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 Yes, uh, Dr. Kumar, Professor Kumar from George Town University. Uh, thank you to, uh, to General Gray, General Rias, Diona, and the other panelists. A very absorbing discussion, very threadbare. Um, I just had a question on, on ISIS particularly. Uh, given the fact that ISIS is also uh, moving in an eastward trajectory, uh, uh, thanks to a number of Indian recruits now, which is kind of news, as well as Al-Qaeda's uh, oft-repeated and now renewed vigor for a Ghazwai-Hind uh, war against India, 
as well as uh, uh, Abu Bakr Bashir in Indonesia talking about funding um, ISIS. Uh, uh, what do you think is is going to be the the, the terrorist uh, uh, kind of uh, action post NATO troop withdrawal from Afghanistan? Because that's kind of a pot boiler uh, terrorism wise as well. You know, Pakistan, Afghanistan, threat to India. That's that's one question in terms of the eastward expansion. The second question is when we talk about uh, the administration talking about a 500 million dollar fund as part of the counterterrorism partnership fund towards arming the uh, Syrian rebels, the F FSA and so on. How does one really distinguish between the FSA, the good Syrian rebels, and the ISIS elements and the al-Nusra, al-Qaeda allied elements, which have also switched over in large numbers to ISIS? Uh, two questions. Thank you. It's not fair. <laughs> you know, uh, you've just expanded my, my threat my threat threshold enormously. I wasn't so much, I hadn't thought about the Indian and Pakistan side, but I know they talked a lot about Central Asia. So I don't know, but uh, I think the goal in their minds is there. Whether it's possible to do it, I don't know. Whether they're spread too thin in Iraq because they're also trying to sustain the Syria part of this. Again, I don't know. You've got to ask someone who's a little bit more clever uh, in terms of military, uh, deployment and engagement and, and how strong they are. And I'm not so sure of that. Um, on the others, the good versus the bad Syrians, you know, I've carpooled with the Syrian for seven or eight years. You'd think I'd know the answer to this by now. <laughs> but um, have I would think that our own history shows that we really don't, are not able to distinguish good from bad. Uh, or, you know, tell me who the good guys are and I'll take care of the rest. I don't think we... Uh, are very good at, at really uh, parsing that out. Who's good today could be bad tomorrow. And I also think that we're being so careful about seeing that uh, weapons don't get and fall into the hands of the bad Syrians. And look what happened in Iraq when we gave this stuff to the Iraqis and they abandoned it and ran. And now uh, helped the ISIS efforts both in Iraq and the stuff went back into Syria. How do you do that? How do you, and I would, I was thinking of it yesterday, because Congress was demanding, can you guarantee to us that those weapons we give them won't go, be absurd. You can't, you can't, you can't guarantee anything like that. I mean, I wish Congress would stop playing to the audience at home, you know, Joe Sixpack or whatever. There you go, Joe Sixpack. Uh, I don't know him. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's, the, the reality hasn't hit anywhere that people were, to think, but you're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, if I could add one yeah. point. I'm watching for when ISIS overplays their hand yeah. on, on a, for, on a right. force side. This happened with Al-Qaeda. Right. It, it, it happens, somebody reaches their culminating point, they don't realize it and they go too far. And then the pendulum swings the other way. Yeah. Uh, you never know when that <coughs> happens, usually until after the fact, but uh, I f they're probably almost there. That's that no, that's a great point. It, uh, going back to something I said was that if we see that, that the uh, Iraqi side, the tribes and the ex-military uh, break with them, uh, that might be an indicator, yes. but the, in, the pre-indicator is that uh, a number of those people are missing. They've been taken from their houses, uh, they've been arrested, maybe killed, nobody knows. So maybe we're seeing signs of that, but that would be a, a, good, a good indicator. Okay, well, we'll have uh, one or two more questions. Uh, and just a little footnote to make it a little bit more complicated, <laughs> so that, uh, is, uh, you know, we, we have to put into the equ equation also the so-called homegrown uh, terrorists, for example, in Western uh, China, uh, that they are inspired with what's happening uh, elsewhere, that terrorists, uh, as you indicated before, uh, are becoming mini-state in many, many ways that I don't want to, to, to go into the Gaza situation. It's too complicated without that, but uh, what is uh, really important is the globalization mm -hmm. of that kind of threat. It's not regional, it's inter-regional. <coughs> I don't want to throw in Latin America and Africa and all that. that. Okay, <laughs> let me ask Ambassador Marx. Uh, would you kindly come up here quickly so that they, they will see you come, come a little bit up. Okay. Yeah, over there, quickly. All right. Um, 
This has been a fascinating discussion, and let me first preface whatever I'm going to say by the remark that I'm an outsider. I know nothing about this area except what I hear when I'm watching. And what strikes me as much as anything else, this is the conversation looking at the map, is that I see, when you talk about the Middle East, three robust, viable, modern nation states, Iran, Turkey, and Israel, and neither of the three are Arab. Are what we're seeing in the Middle East is sort of a fundamental collapse, disillusion of the Arab culture, political society, call it what you will, possibly analogous to the fall of the Roman Empire in Western Europe. And if we're seeing that, we're in for a long, long period of turmoil and then reconstruction eventually. Thank you. Okay, one, one more question. Thank you all for the great presentations. Um, there has, in this region, in the past, Russia played a very murky role. And I'm wondering now with this sort of rise of this Russian militarism demonstrated by last week's events, do we see Russia coming in again to further complicate issues? Yeah, they're already in. Well, not militarily, if you mean that they're going for their warm water port and to take over countries there, that's long gone. If it ever existed, no, that you don't see. But they have influence and they have a lot of money to make, a lot of business. And partly what we're seeing is sort of a, I don't know what to call it, not a cold war, but there's a, you know, a mentality which is starting to, you know, going to oppose anything you want to do. But the Russians have a lot of money to make by dealing with Iran, and they have a lot of invested in Syria, and they would like to, but they're, they're not winning hearts and minds if that's what you're looking at. It's not that, and they're not going to uh, send troops in and, they, they, they've never really done that, except for Afghanistan. And they can be a yeah, but they, yeah, as you pointed out, they've got a long history of, uh, for example, cooperating with Iran. Go back to pre-World War II and World War II was much uh, Russian influence, uh, and they always try to influence uh, nations that are on their border no, and that kind of thing. Be careful, what you're talking about there was the spheres of influence of World War II. That was Russian occu Soviet occupation. No, no, what I'm talking about is a Russian influence, whether it was Soviet or not, or even before the Soviet Union. They, they, they've always had uh, an interest in Iran, and, and they do now. Yeah, but you're talking about military. No, I'm, I'm not talking talk about military. I'm but talking it about. World War II. No. It's the, for example, construction of 20 nuclear power plants. Lots of money to be made. And by the way, if it makes the region a little bit more difficult or makes them look better, so much the better. It's money. Can we? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, would you like to make a comment on the map or anything? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe somebody has a quick comment. No, no, no. I, I would like to get your... Yeah, okay. uh, yes, I would like to... Uh, regarding the constitution of Iraq and uh, sectarianism and so on, Actually, if you ask any Iraqian, again, I will not uh, speak my opinion. If you ask any Iranians who visited here, the Speaker of the Parliament, the members of Parliament, uh, even some ministers who came here, they will tell you that the problem was the Constitution originally that made this country sectarian and divided. The quota, a president is a president is Kurd, Prime Minister is a Sunni. Is a not in the Constitution. You're wrong. No, uh, I, I, maybe I am no. wrong. It's okay. It, that's your. Uh, you are entitled to your Make opinion. But I remember not that opinion. Iraq. I didn't say that. I said that the Iraqis uh, who are he, who came here, they said the primers, the primers, when primer was there as 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 under the occupation Iraq, uh, it was the really the Constitution that made these uh, things. Maybe it's wrong, but I didn't say it. He said it. No. Well, <laughs> this, uh, the, the, this is one. I would, like you, I would like to refer you regarding what's going on in the Middle East yes. to the sectarian division of the, of the countries in the Middle East. I was in Turkey as ambassador in 2006. And there is a NATO meeting somewhere in the, in the meeting somewhere. And the Turks attended that meeting of the NATO and they discussed the plan, the new plan, the new map for the Middle East. I would, I would like you to refer you to that map. You can Google it also, the new map of the Middle East. You will find that 
many Arab countries. What is going on from 2006 at that time? You look at that map and look at it now. You find that the division in, within Lebanon, within Iraq, within Syria, it's all there in name. Kurdistan took part of this of Turkey, and Iraq took part of this, and, then, and so on. So please read that map, it, you'll find the truth that what's going on is a sectarian regime in different countries in the Arab world. Okay, now uh, mm -hmm. before I give the last word to the general, I, I am a duty, an obligation general, and the obligation is the following. Number one. Don't pay any attention to this part. This no, no, you do. <laughs> I, I would like again to call your attention time. to the general's book and his uh, leadership, uh, which is so critical, especially now, and um, you have information on the book. I would like to present the book, if I may, general, to our speakers so they can take it with them. Is this okay? Yeah, it's, okay. Not, it's not my We're book. not selling it, and, and by the way, all the royalties of the book, they uh, actually are distributed <laughs> to the families of uh, the soldiers who were killed and wounded. So number one, I like to mention that. Secondly, uh, well, we can give them most of this book, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> About the Al-Qaeda, that's okay. And uh, thirdly, I, I would like to, to mention some other books that um, are authored by our colleagues from the University of Virginia Law School, by the way. And uh, we work with many institutions all over the world. Finally, and then I'm going to turn this to you, General, I would like to recognize some of the people um, at our center who contributed to our scholarship and research and so forth. First of all, the uh, interns, we do have an interns program. We're very proud of it because we're trying to educate and to train, as we always say, the next generation of scholars and practitioners and diplomats um, and people who work with refugees, humanitarian service and the Peace Corps and so on. Um, I would like the group to come up here so they will be, first of all, recognized. Sharon, would you please call them and they will state their name, not the security, social security number, but the university. Okay, but you did, okay. Hi, my name is Sharon Leani. I'm a research coordinator here at ICTS. I'd like to thank our summer 2014 intern class they help contribute not only to this seminar, but also many other projects that Professor Alexander works on during the year. If you'll all briefly introduce yourself. Um, I'm Tyler Engler, and I study international politics at Georgetown. Don't go away. This is his last day, and I'm taking this opportunity to award him the certificate, the diploma for his uh, work this semester. We're very, very proud of you, and uh, we wish you the best in the future. Thank you. Okay? Shake my hand. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm Stephanie Emerson, and I study political science at the University of Chicago. I'm Avi Oskanan. I study communication at the University of Maryland. I'm Thomas Turner, and I study uh, leadership and public policy at the um, University of Virginia. I'm Gabriella Grishas, and I study international relations in German at Boston University. Um, I'm Frank Randall, and I double major in history and political science at St. Francis College. Uh, Andrew Dubois, I double major in Middle Eastern studies and history at Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. My name is Reed Woodrum, and I study international and public policy at Princeton University. I'm Sonam Burke. I study international relations at the University of the Pacific in California. Last but not least, I would like to recognize Marianne Cole, a writer in the back. 
Shaken, she contributes to our uh, publication. And by the way, uh, Mr. Ambassador, your own statement we just published and we'll get you, the, I will say, the copy of the, the report. Today? What Every about the one today? <laughs> today, it's still the beginning. <laughs> we have to prepare it, but <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, obviously, as we always say, uh, the general has the last word. And General Gray, it's all yours. <laughs> I think obviously everybody's uh, had enough here. They really. I I think the the thing that really strikes me uh, all through the years when you look at the at world history and go back as far as you want, uh, two, three, four, five thousand years, whatever. Um, some of these issues have been around a long, long time, and they're going to be around uh, for a while. And it seems to me again that it. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of understanding on both parts uh, to try to come up with some solutions. And I, I, I worry a little bit that that uh, in-depth thought process and that in-depth study uh, doesn't seem to be taking place. There, I know there are experts working on this, and they know far more than I want to about these issues. but. I, I just don't see I, I know that uh, the United States and and other uh, world leaders and, and nations and like would like to to bring about the right kind of solutions uh, we uh, we apparently do not have quite the same uh, leadership uh, potential in the world today as we did before uh, that could be debatable but that's a a very transient type of thing as well. I mean, I think uh, I think the United States has much to offer uh, in terms of uh, world peace and, and bringing it all about. But people have long memories. And uh, I can remember, for example, uh, uh, Syria, uh, the Syria that I knew uh, during the first Gulf War and the Syria that I know under Assad, uh, they will never be uh, my favorite country. And they, they won't be because of what they did uh, with Iran and being the middleman in Damascus to uh, fund the Hezbollah uh, the and uh, the terrorist activity that took down our embassy. It took down uh, my Marine headquarters there and took down the Israeli headquarters. And so that's just something that is never going to go away. And I will remember that as long as I'm alive. In fact, during the first Gulf War, uh, President Bush had worked out the, uh, the overall uh, challenge and brought the, the Mideast together, if you will, uh, to counter what Saddam Hussein had done. But I remember that the plan that uh, General Powell and General Schwarzkopf uh, dreamed up had, uh, had the Syrians uh, alongside of the Marines and then the Egyptians, and I reminded them that you better not do that because we don't like the Syrians, and my Marines are liable to take them out on the way in, so they put the Egyptians uh, on, our, on our left flank instead of the Syrians. But I'm serious here. These, uh, these types of thoughts go a long, long, long way. I know a little bit about Turkey. When I was a young lieutenant in Korea, I was a forward observer for the Turkish Brigade. And I understand their mentality, how they feel about certain things. And you need, to, you need to understand how the Turkish people feel about some of the Kurds. They don't like them. And, and it's not going to uh, get better overnight. So how do you bring this potpourri, if you will, of, of thoughts and nations and all that together to work out something? Uh, I, again, I go back to it has to be negotiations. Thank you all for being with us. I thought it was a great uh, afternoon. And, uh, Yona, we went over a little bit over time, but it's okay. <laughs>